20th century has seen some spectacular developments in science and technology that have really transformed our lives. All you have to do is to think about air and space travel, the personal computer and the internet, and of course, the discovery of the genetic code and the sequencing of the human genome. Well, chemists have played an enormous role in that, and one of the things we've done is we've really developed the tools to understand what makes molecules tick. Such is the pace of change in chemistry that we've gone from test tubes and colorless liquids to a discipline where chemists are working with physicists and biologists more than ever to understand how life works. In the 21st century, chemistry is moving on fast. In fact, we're moving beyond the molecule. And this new understanding is actually allowing us to design molecular systems and devices. We're going to see how this new knowledge is blurring the boundaries between traditional chemistry and the other sciences, and how a new generation of chemists is actually applying this new knowledge and answering some of the most fundamental questions of our universe. It's often assumed that chemistry, while useful, can't really answer the fundamental questions about how life actually works. That seems more like biology, but that just can't be true. Chemistry is absolutely fundamental. Take pattern formation, for example. How could chemistry actually put markings on the side of an organism? Let me show you. What I have here is the famous beluzov shabotinsky reaction, which shows how chemical systems self-organize when mixed together. And what's interesting about it is that when it's left unstirred to itself, patterns magically appear within it. You just put the right molecules together, and new and exciting structures appear. The problem is knowing which molecules to use. What chemists are beginning to learn are the rules that underpin these processes. And the result is that we're getting precise control over how and where reactions occur. Nanoscience sits in that gray area between individual molecules and bulk matter. Nanotechnology is one area of science which looks set to revolutionize our way of life. It's the world at the nanoscale. That's one billionth of a meter. Nanochemistry is an area which has been steadily developing, and now scientists are beginning to actually control organized arrays of molecules and their function. And people realize how hey, we can design molecules now to start to do the things that we want them to do. So this is one of the typical labs where we would do some of our highly sensitive experiments. Dr. Charles Fall is a nanochemist at the University of Bristol. He's designing molecular systems, some of which could be the next generation of medical diagnosis. If you have the possibility to design a molecule that would, for instance, interact very specifically with uh, a marker from a cancer cell, if you can design a material that would interact very specifically with that marker and then show a response, for instance, change color, you could put it on your tongue and take it out and if there's a color change, then you know, okay, something is wrong, you need to see the doctor. How do you design a molecule that would interact very specifically with only one specific marker? And I think and this is where the challenge lies. By understanding the molecules and the interactions between them, Charles is actually designing a molecular system that can assemble itself. If you take the example of water and oil, you shake it up, you know that it will mix into two phases. You don't have to do anything to get these things to organize in this way or to assemble in this way. They will do it by nature. We try to do exactly the same with our molecules. So we build into molecules areas, for instance, that would like water. We build areas into the molecules that like oil. So what happens is all the oily bits will assemble together. All the watery bits will get together. And this way they will self-assemble. I don't have to do anything to do that. We apply basic principles so that we can finally get to the point where we can design materials to assemble in the way that we want them. Nanotechnology is coming to the forefront because new techniques are now available, enabling scientists to analyze substances at the molecular level. At the University of Bristol, Charles has at his disposal one of the most technically advanced buildings in the world for this research. Fred Hale, I'm the Operational Building and Resources Manager for the Bristol Centre for Nanoscience and Quantum Information. My role is to uh, run the day-to-day -day operations of the centre, providing an environment that can be used by you know, chemists, engineers, physicists, uh, medics. Basically, yeah, it's a bit of a research hotel, so people can come in, 
use the facilities here, do what they need to do. I guess I'm the, uh, the hotel manager, the Basil Fawlty of the centre, really. But, yeah. <laughs> the Centre for Nanoscience and Quantum Information is much more than just a collection of labs. When you go below the surface, into the basement, you find something rather unique, including one of the quietest rooms in the world. All you can really hear is your own inner noise. Yeah. If you stay here too long, I, I find uh, you start to swim about a bit because you lose your sense of balance because there's no real reflections. To, uh... The reason these labs are so quiet is they're specifically designed to have zero vibrations. If you're working at the nanoscale, even the vibration from a passing car is enough to move your sample. We don't want any sort of interference. Uh, so we're concerned with electromagnetic noise, uh, acoustic noise, and mostly with vibrations. This is a five-ton block of concrete. You can probably see the, the tape moving there. So that's sunk into the floor. We've got this huge called ground slab, and then we further isolate the experiments on these blocks, and they, they work extremely well. Shaw Fall's work in the centre involves using atomic force microscopy to look at the materials he's produced. What you have here is basically a very sharp tip that you would pull across a surface. So if you have molecules lying flat on the surface, this tip will feel them and will lift and basically in that way you'll be able to have a map of the morphology. So of course, for that you can imagine if you really want to look at, at atomic resolution of your, of your molecules, you would need an extremely quiet environment. This work produces some incredible images of molecules. In the future, nanochemistry could bring us a new generation of medicines. Targeted drug release certainly has, has wide applications. Of course, the question is how do you bring your drug close to the point where you want to release it? And of course, how do you shield it away from the body you know, that the body doesn't see it as foreign and attack the drug before it actually gets to the point where it, can, where it can actually do its work? These are not inconsiderable problems. But with scientists around the world working on nanochemistry research, it won't be long before we start seeing new drugs and other new applications becoming available. Carbon. Its compounds are often said to be the foundations for life on Earth. But do we really know everything about it? The textbooks tell us that there are basically three forms. Hard, crystalline diamond, soft, slippery graphite. And then there are the fullerenes, those beautiful geodesic molecules like this one. But there's more to carbon than this. Have you ever asked yourself what happens if you take a pencil and scribble on a piece of paper? That layer I've left behind is less than just graphite. It's graphene, a layer of carbon, just one atom thick, which is set to completely change our lives. Here at the University of Exeter, they're so inspired by graphene that they've set up a centre to study it. This is the Centre for Graphene Science. Dr. Sharon Strawbridge is a chemist working at the centre. The centre is just one example of the kinds of collaborations between scientists from different areas, which are happening more and more as the boundaries between disciplines become increasingly blurred. The Centre for Graphene Science was set up just over a year ago. We're looking across all aspects of graphene science. I'm obviously a chemist, I'm interested in the chemical properties. We've got engineers looking at large-scale production of graphene and we all work with each other, which means it's very collaborative. I think that that is a very, very good way of describing graphene as a gigantic, if you like, net of carbon atoms hexagonally bonded or extensive chicken wire. What's got chemists so excited is that because graphene is just a single layer of carbon atoms, this is quite literally taking science into another dimension. We're used to a world that's three-dimensional. It is essentially a two-dimensional material. The physics and the chemistry involved with that is extremely interesting. But to be able to isolate a single sheet is really incredibly exciting. It's, it's a completely new material. The potential of graphene has opened up the door to a new generation of electronics. Graphene can be good in electronics because it's a very good conductor and potentially it has very high mobility, which is a measure of how the electrons in this material respond to an, an electric field uh, applied along it. It can be potentially much better than silicon, which is used in technology at the moment. 
we're almost down to the point that silicon will become obsolete. We've got so many transistors on the chip and it's getting to the point now that they're so close together, you're almost to the point where they start to talk to one another and you get to problems. You get a lot of heat generated by these transistors. And actually the limitation in the speed of computers now is not necessarily how small you can make them, but how, how you can dissipate that heat. How can you get smaller? The only practical element that you could do this with is really carbon-based electronics. IBM and MIT are creating transistors now out of graphene that can be running up to 100 gigahertz or more. This all sounds incredible, but why aren't we all using graphene-based electronics today? One of the major problems comes when you try to isolate it. First, make sure you work in a clean room so no dust is transferred to the materials. Second, take a piece of graphite any graphite will do. Graphite is essentially layers of graphene stacked together. Now take some ordinary sellotape and then squish the graphite onto the sellotape until bits come off. Next, make sure it's all clean using ethanol. Then tidy up after yourself. Go back out of the clean room again. Then painstakingly search your sellotape for any one atom thick graphene that may have come off. The thing that's holding it back is to be able to produce graphene on a large scale. At the moment, the very best quality is the graphene that we get from this exfoliation of crystalline graphene. We need to move beyond that, and that's some of the work that Monica's involved in. In the last year, there have been a lot of progress in this direction, but it's not yet possible to grow really large area of single layer graphene. The, the layers that have been grown, they have patches of a single layer of a few micron size, and then uh, the next challenge is to find a way to really grow uniform uh, graphene layers. Despite these problems, progress is being made and it could change our lives forever. Maybe in 15, 20 years time, we're moving to a, an era where we're going to be looking at carbon electronics. We're going to be looking at molecular electronics. Just think how much electronics have changed in the last 10 years. Graphene-based electronics could accelerate this change to give us devices we can't even yet imagine. Chemistry is set to move us into the future, but can it shed light on our past? One of the hardest and deepest questions we can ask is, where did we come from? How did life actually start? Well, I have beside me a recreation of an experiment carried out almost 60 years ago, which was really the first attempt to try and answer this very question. It's called the Miller-Urey experiment, and it's really an attempt to recreate planet Earth several billion years ago. We have an ocean boiling away and an atmosphere containing methane, nitrogen, hydrogen, and carbon dioxide. And there is lightning in the sky. Miller and Urey left their experiment running for several weeks. And at the end, their ocean contained a brown goo the results surprised everyone. In that goo were some of the fundamental building blocks of life, including amino acids. This experiment inspired chemists since to look into this area in more detail, and we're beginning to gain an understanding of how life might have arisen in the early Earth, to gain clues about how life actually formed, and even whether there might be life elsewhere. At the University of Leeds works Dr. Terry Key, an astrochemist. If we consider life as being biology, before that there must be something called chemistry. We don't know the transition that occurred on this planet from chemistry to biology. And that's ultimately where we're, where we're looking to focus our, our, our efforts. Terry and his team are investigating how life originated here on Earth how early chemicals might have formed, and they're particularly interested in phosphorus. Phosphorus is a fundamental chemical in DNA, RNA. It goes to make up the cell membranes. It also is a, a key element in providing the molecules for energy that our body uses. So take phosphorus out of life, and uh, there wouldn't be any life as we understand it. Oh. 
This is a bench top mass spectrometer here and we use this to measure gas evolution from uh, various experiments. The problem Terry's wrestling with is the fact that phosphorus, in the form we find it on Earth, phosphate, isn't very soluble in water and would have had trouble reacting to form complex molecules. But he might have found the answer. Certainly within a period of half a billion years from the, the formation of the, the Earth, we could expect that our Earth would be peppered by meteorites, cometary fragments, in something called the late heavy bombardment. This is an iron meteorite. Particular chemicals that we're interested in here are the phosphorus chemicals, and they're mixtures of iron, nickel, and phosphorus called schreibersite. There's a little picture of it there. This thing, that is iron, nickel, phosphide, and schreibersite. Terry and his team are working on creating a simulated space environment to work out how meteorites might have delivered the right kind of phosphorus to kickstart life on Earth. Some of the chemistry that we're looking at with phosphorus starts from meteorites, and meteorites have inclusions within them of this material called schreibersite. And what we can do is we can treat this with water, heat it, and we get out a number of phosphorus compounds, one of which we're quite interested in, which is this fellow here. And this guy is called phosphonic acid. We heat it to round about 130 degrees. It loses water and it reacts to form a rather unusual phosphorus species called pyrophosphite. What we're looking at is just how this rather reactive form of phosphorus could have been used as an agent to transfer phosphorus in a prebiotic context. Terry's team have discovered that these compounds could well have provided phosphorus in a form that could have been incorporated into organic molecules, the first precursors to life. The question of where we came from I think is really quite an important one because it will tell us a little bit about how life in general could have emerged and how it may emerge in the future, how it may have emerged in the past, how it may emerge again. It may give us an indication as to how the whole process of evolution of life may change and what the role of life is in the universe. Whereas my specific problems are sort of kind of focused on how did one go from chemistry to biology. The wider payoff might be, what do we learn about ourselves as a result of it? When I talk to people about exciting chemistry, I think most of them assume that it's all gonna be about bubbling mixtures and things that go pop. But the reality is that many of the most exciting materials around us actually look pretty mundane. As I paint, you might imagine that the white pigment in the paint, titanium dioxide, would be one of the most boring materials on the planet. But you'd be wrong. Titanium dioxide is actually one of the whitest materials in the universe and one of the most interesting materials of the moment. It's central to unlikely applications like self-cleaning glass, like water purification, and perhaps most importantly, answering our energy needs. At University College London, the amazing properties of titanium dioxide have inspired chemists to look into using it to harness the power of the sun to make energy. About 5% of the sun's energy hitting the Earth's surface is uh, UV light. And titania can absorb this light and it can give this energy to an electron, which then becomes excited and goes into an excited state. And it's the ability, which is quite unique to titania, to keep this electron separated from the positive charge that it left behind for a long time. These are the, the reactive species which generate all the really interesting chemistry and, and physics which is involved with titania. The simplicity of using titanium dioxide in harnessing the power of sunlight is opening the door to a new generation of solar cells. Well, we've already seen them commercially integrated into backpacks and bags. Um, next we could be sort of wearing solar cells generating electricity as we walk around in the sunshine every day. So we're going to put together a very, very rough uh, desensitized solar cell here. A solar cell made with titanium dioxide is so simple to make, it can be done on just a lab bench. All it takes is a conducting liquid placed onto a glass slide that's covered in titanium dioxide. We're going to take our, our iodine electrolyte and just drop it onto the surface 
And then it's as simple as sandwiching these two together. And there you have it, a disensitized solar cell. And that's really how easy it is to make. We've connected one up over here. You'll see that we're about 142 uh, millivolts here, just from the ambient light. If I then turn on a light source, you can see the voltage is going to shoot up. And this is because we're adding light energy into our system. And then it's this voltage that if we connect a circuit up to, will drive the current round and we can get work out of our solar cell. So the limitations we're having commercialising dye sensitised solar cells really result from the fact that uh, you're using this liquid iodine electrolyte. So there's been a lot of problems in actually sealing up the dye cells so they can last the lifetime of a solar cell, which is typically about 20 years. Matthew's colleague, Dr. Jeff Hyatt, is using titanium dioxide to produce hydrogen gas, which has obvious advantages over the solar cells. What if you want to switch on your lights uh, when it's dark? Are you, when the solar energy isn't present, how can you store that energy? Um, so the advantage of not directly producing electricity is you have it as a chemical store. Of course, one of the questions is how do you get your hydrogen? The current method of making hydrogen is actually by burning uh, petrochemicals or processing petrochemicals. So of course, it's not really a solution. But by splitting water using solar energy, it's another way of getting hydrogen. Titanium dioxide is central to this water splitting process. So what's happening here is that the TO2 is being irradiated it's absorbing that uh, light, it's promoting electrons, so it's exciting electrons in the material. And the bubbles coming off the surface there are hydrogen gas. So in scale up, we'll be collecting that gas, it's collecting in the headspace here, and you could take that off and use it as a fuel source. Titanium dioxide does have many advantages, and it's a great uh, material to start the research on. Its principal disadvantage, its sort of uh, ultimate downfall, is it only absorbs the ultraviolet part of the solar spectrum, which only makes about 10% of the solar spectrum. So that's sort of the maximum, the upper limit on the efficiency. And that's quite a crippling upper limit if that's the best you can do. So what we'd like to do is develop new materials um, that have many of the advantages of titania, but can start to use more of the solar spectrum. So it can start to absorb in the visible. Most of the energy is available in the visible, so plan to use visible light. And we'd like to develop new materials that can take advantage of that as well. Mimicking nature is, ironically, one of the hardest things to do. But one man is attempting this. This is a microscope. We can take photographs of the crystals recording. Professor James Barber at Imperial College London is running a project called the Artificial Leaf. When you look at the amount of energy that we require uh, now and also in the future, and then you look at what is available to us, then there is no energy source other than fossil fuels that can supply the amounts of energy that we need. And if you look at alternatives to fossil fuels, hydroelectric for example, nuclear or wind, none of them would supply anywhere near the amount of energy that we would require globally, that is. On the other hand, one hour of sunlight is equal to all the energy that we currently consume on the planet in one year. And nature has managed to harness this energy. This colossal amount of solar energy available to us, that is to the planet, um, has been captured and turned into chemical bonds through the process of photosynthesis over millions of years. Inside the plant leaf is an enzyme called Photosystem 2. It's this enzyme that actually splits water in the same way as titanium dioxide. But it does it efficiently using visible light. As Professor Barber's work developed, it became clear that they had to understand how Photosystem 2 actually works. I set aside all other work that I was doing to focus on obtaining the structure of Photosystem 2. These are actually are some mutants you can see there. and these So these are... Um, being cultivated on agar, ready for inoculation. Professor Barber succeeded in obtaining crystals of the enzyme. Not easy for such a complex protein. You might think, oh, that's simple, because you can, you can easily get a crystal of copper sulfate or of sodium chloride or something. But this is a very complicated, uh, uh, complex protein with many different subunits. It's got nearly 20 different subunits. With the crystals in hand, using X-ray crystallography, he slowly mapped the huge structure of Photosystem II. 
and his efforts paid off. At the heart of this enzyme, which is actually composed of many different proteins, is the catalytic center where the water splitting reaction occurs, uh, where light energy is used to split water into oxygen and electrons and protons. And this uh, catalytic center is composed of four manganese ions and a calcium ion. This manganese cluster self-assembles even when the leaf is damaged, and so maybe answers the question to finding a long-lasting hydrogen-producing cell. There's been a lot of interest in trying to mimic it, and it's an obvious thing you want to do because taking hydrogen out of water using sunlight uh, is one of the great uh, challenges for mankind. Once the hydrogen has been produced, the challenge is to store it and convert it into electricity on demand. It's a challenge that could provide an answer to our energy problems. This is really the only option that we have which is realistic and that and we know can be done, just a matter of effort. If the leaf can do it, we can do it, but we have to do it better. This is an incredibly exciting time to be in chemistry, and in this program we've barely scratched the surface of the exciting developments that are taking place at the moment. Chemistry is providing answers to some of the fundamental questions of our time, and also producing new materials and devices that are going to transform our lives. In the coming decades, I think we can expect to see mobile phones with graphene chips, nanomedicines in our hospitals, Perhaps a transport fleet based on hydrogen produced by sunlight. Who knows? We might even answer the question of whether there is life elsewhere in the universe. There are still plenty of challenges to be faced and things to be found out. But with our new techniques and understanding of the way molecules work, it's clear we're entering a new era in chemistry.